thanks for joining us, much appreciated. And today we are talking about the attempt by Penguin Random House, which is the number one publishing company in, um, in the United States in particular, but also to a degree in other Anglo-Saxon countries like the UK, Australia, etc. So the attempt by Penguin Random House, number one in the uh, publishing book publishing industry, to acquire uh, uh, Simon and Shuster, which is the number four um, publishing house in in particular in the U.S. So why was it blocked on antitrust grounds, and uh, what does this uh, mean in terms of interventionism intervention? Uh, by state entities in global MAs nowadays. So back in 2020, Penguin Random House, um, uh, uh, pending Penguin Random House acquisition of Simon and Schuster seemed a given to all insiders from the book publishing industry. Uh, they actually changed their tune in um, November 2021, so exactly a year ago, when the US Department of Justice, the DOJ, filed a lawsuit to block the deal. And it, it actually just won. We, uh, the, the, um, the decision was handed down on the 31st of October 2022, and it actually won. So why did the Penguin Random House's acquisition of Simon and Shuster fail through? And um, uh, what does it say about current MA antitrust enforcement policy in the US, but also globally? Well, let's have a look at the facts first. Simon & Schuster is an American publishing company founded in New York City in January 1924 by Richard Simon and Max Schuster. So here you have uh, Simon and Schuster. Its initial commercial break came from publishing crossword, puzzle, cross, crossword puzzles after Richard Simon's aunt, a crossword puzzle enthusiast, asked whether there was a book of uh, New York World crossword puzzles out there to buy as a gift. The New York World it was a, a, a magazine very, um, very um, famous in the New York area. And so since there was none, there was no book of New York World crossword puzzles. And sensing an opportunity, Richard Simon and uh, Max Shuster started a publishing house that focused on publishing crossword puzzles initially. At the beginning of, uh, at the end, sorry, of 2005, Simon Schuster was part of the American multinational media conglomerate, CBS Corporation. And uh, in 2019, CBS and Viacom reunited to form Viacom CBS. So as a result, uh, Simon and Schuster became part of the newly formed Viacom CBS conglomerate, which has since rebranded as Paramount Global in 2022. This is because this American multinational mass media and entertainment conglomerate owns the Paramount Pictures, film and TV television studio, among other entities. So in March 2020, Viacom CBS, as it was still called at the time, so Viacom CBS CEO Bob Backish announced his intention to sell the Simon & Schuster division as it does not have significant connection for our broader business. And this is actually a very fair statement. I had a look at the assets and various companies that Viacom CBS slash Paramount Global owes. And um, it's it's absolutely true that you, you don't really understand what Simon & Schuster Publishing House is doing there in the middle of all these assets as they are mostly focused on um, um, media assets and companies like Paramount Pictures. So several contenders came knocking at the door. I mean, having said that though, Simon Chester is, is, um, is a jewel, okay? It's a jewel on the crown. It's, it is, it's absolutely, it's not, so, not an asset that you just would want to uh, put in the bin. It's, it's a very, as I said, it's a number four uh, player in the book publishing industry in, uh, in particular in the US. So of course, several contenders came knocking at the door among them, German media group Bertelsmann, which owns 
number one publishing company, Penguin Random House. Also the French mass media holding company Vivendi, which owns French publisher Editis, showed some interest. And American mass media and publishing company News Corp, which owns uh, HarperCollins, which is also one of the big five uh, of these uh, book publishing companies. So they all came knocking at the door. And Viacom CBS told them that they were expecting the bids to be placed before the 26th of November, 2020. One day before, on the 25th of November, Viacom CBS announced it would sell Simon & Schuster to Bertelsmann subsidiary Penguin Random House LLC, so PRH, for 2.175 billion US dollars in cash. So they wouldn't buy the shares, they would actually buy the whole thing in cash. So the transaction was expected to close in 2021, subject to customary closing conditions, including regulatory approvals. It is unclear, but likely whether PRH made some filings with and required some clearances from the United States Department of Justice, or the DOJ, as it is abbreviated, or the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, under the Hart Scott Rodino Act, but probably, they probably made some filings because the, um, uh, this, this acquisition, this, uh, this um, merger was meeting three of the criteria under the Hart Scott Rodino Act. However, and since the horizontal acquisition, i.e., an acquisition between competitors of Simon Schuster by PRH, would have created a publishing company that controlled roughly one third of the worldwide publishing business, the Department of Justice, the DOJ, filed a civil antitrust lawsuit on the 2nd of November 2021 to block it under Section 7 of the Clayton Act. And I quote here, ensure fate, fair competition in the US publishing industry. The DOJ's complaint is actually available on uh, the written version of this uh, content, which is um, viewable on crefovi.com slash publications or in French at crefovi.fr slash publication. And you can view our uh, limited access and uh, confidential content by becoming a subscriber to our uh, yearly plan on crefovi.com slash store or for the French version, French language of his content on crefovi.fr slash magasin. So on there, you will see the complaint filed by the DOJ. So the lawsuit went to trial in August 2022 with the DOJ's star witness, the author Stephen King, the uh, master of horror, and Gore, uh, whose works are actually published by Simon and Schuster, testifying in the US District Court for the District of Cali Columbia in Washington, DC. Other industry luminaries, among them powerful literary agents and other best-selling authors also testified. Even executives from other major publishing houses, among them the heads of Hachette and HarperCollins, uh, more on these publishing companies in, in, later on in this uh, in this webinar also testified against the acquisition. After a 13-day trial in uh, Washington D.C., which lasted until the 19th of August 2022, U.S. District Court Judge Florence Pan made a final verdict on 31st of October 2022, as I said before, deciding that the acquisition should be blocked by a permanent injunction. While the full order is temporarily sealed to allow the parties to review the, for confidentiality, a brief two-page document was released by the District Court for the District of Columbia, stating that upon review, and I quote here, uh, upon review of the extensive record and careful consideration of the party's arguments, the court finds that the US has shown that the effect of a proposed merger may be substantially maybe to substantially lessen competition in the market for the US publishing rights to anticipated top selling books. Well, this is a blow for the acquisition. PRH said that it was planning to appeal the permanent injunction through the release of the following statement. We strongly disagree with today's decision, which is an unfortunate setback for readers and authors, and we will immediately request an expedited appeal. As we demonstrated throughout the trial, 
the DOJ's focus on advances to the world's best paid authors instead of consumers or the intense competitiveness in the publishing sector runs contrary to its mission to ensure fair competition. We believe this acquisition will be pro-competitive and we will continue to work closely with Paramount and Simon Schuster on next steps. However, PRH could only appeal the decision if Paramount Global, Simon & Schuster's parent company, agreed to extend the acquisition, which purchase agreement was due to expire on the 22nd of November, 2022. But Paramount Global decided to let the purchase agreement for the acquisition expire, which triggered a 200 million US dollars termination fee for PRH to pay to Paramount Global. So that's a pretty hefty um, fee to pay uh, and shows that perhaps they should have thought out this acquisition a bit more carefully at PRH. Anyway, Paramount Global decided not to proceed with the uh, PRH's acquisition of Simon & Schuster, concluding that it was not worth challenging the, uh, the DOJ, the um, Department of Justice in court. So this example shows that at the moment, the um, even US, uh, US agencies and, um, and institutions are, are ready to actually step in when there is a, a threat of over-concentration in a particular industry. And this is despite the fact that for so many years in decades, decades, the US has been a very pro-merger country. Well, not anymore. So over consolidation would further narrow down the oligopoly that already exists in the book publishing market, and this, uh, the state of, uh, of the US state has decided not to allow. The book publishing industry is structured in such a way that five publishers, which are actually called the Big Five, dominate US and United Kingdom publishing in particular, but also uh, uh, almost basically the worldwide. Um, you know, range of, of book publishing publishers. So for example, they make up 90% of the market for anticipated top selling books. They hold the lion's shares in the book manufacturing and selling industry. And with so many resources at their disposal, they have the ability to make or break a book release. Despite churning out innumerable number of releases each year, many writers find it difficult to make connection with the big five, resulting in more and more authors decided to self-publish instead. So among those big five are PRH, so Penguin Random House, well, that we uh, have already mentioned and discussed, which is the world's largest book publisher and which was formed from the 2013 merger of Penguin and Random House, which were founded in 1935 and 1927 respectively. PRH has now more than 300 brands and independent imprints across the world under its umbrella. It has locations in North America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, South America, Asia, and Africa. PRH is more than 90 US imprints across seven publishing groups. In 2020, PRH earned over $2.5 billion US dollars in the US uh, for publishing in terms of publishing revenues. Then we have number two of these big five, which is Hachette. It was founded in 1826, and it is a French publishing house that has acquired a number of well-known imprints, such as Little Brown and Company, Mulholland Books, and Grand Central Publishing. Though Hachette has locations all over the globe, they mainly operate in French, English, and Spanish language books and audiobooks. Then we have number, number three, um, three, Harper Collins, which was first established in 1817, and it cemented, cemented itself as a major publishing player after a number of mergers in the late 80s and 90s. It is now one of the most prolific English language publishers, perhaps most known for its romance jar in prints, Harlequin and Avon books, as well as its divisions for children <clears throat> and teenagers. As I mentioned before, HarperCollins also came knocking at the door when um, Simon & Schuster was on sale, but they offer, their bid was not accepted by um, Paramount Global. 
at the time called CBS Viacom. Then we have number four, Simon Schuster, which we have already discussed, which is the fourth largest US book publisher. It has 30 US imprints across three publishing groups and publishes over 1,000 new titles annually in the US. In 2020, Simon & Schuster earned over 760 million US dollars in US publishing revenues. And then last but not least, number five, Macmillan, which was founded in 1843 and strengthened in 2015 after a number of mergers. With imprints such as Farrar, Strauss, Giroux, St. Martin's Press, and Tor, Macmillan releases books in every genre. So since both S. Simon and & Schuster and uh, PRH, Penguin Random House, are part of the Big Five, the Department of Justice contended in the lawsuit that number one PRH and number four uh, SNS, Simon & Schuster, by total sales, compete fiercely to acquire the rights to publish the anticipated hottest selling books. Um, indeed, the two New York based publishers have impressive stables of blockbuster authors who have sold multi, multiple millions of copies and have scored multi-million dollar deals. So for example, within PRH Constellation uh, are Barack and Michelle Obama, whose package deal for their memoirs totaled an estimated $65 million. There's also Bill Clinton at PRH, who received $15 million for his memoir. Then Tony Morrison, um, late Tony Morrison, was uh, a, a part of a uh, stable of offers, John Grisham and Dan Brown um, as well. Simon and Schuster counts Hillary Clinton, who received a um, $8 million advance for a memoir, as well as Stephen King, as we already mentioned, because he was the star witness in the, in the, um, in the um, uh, lawsuit. And also Bob Woodward and uh, Walter Isaacson uh, are in um, um, SNS uh, stable of offers. So if competitors PRH and the, uh, Simon and & Schuster had been allowed to merge, the combined company would control nearly 50% of the market for the acquisition of publishing rights to anticipated top selling books, hurting competition by reducing advances paid to offers and diminishing output, quantity and variety of books published. Post merger, the two largest publishers would collectively control more than two thirds of this market, leaving hundreds of offers with few alternatives and even less leverage. So in evaluating a potential acquisition of Simon & Schuster, a Bertelsmann board presentation characterized the US publishing industry as an oligopoly of PRH and only four further large publishers, the one we just mentioned, Hachette, HarperCollins, Simon & Schuster, and Macmillan. The acquisition would have made this oligopoly even smaller. It, indeed, it would have reduced uh, five to just four. Because Bertelsmann knew that the acquisition posed a greater antitrust risk than any other potential buyers of Simon & Schuster, it understood that it would have to pay a significant premium over other bidders to acquire Simon & Schuster. And that's probably what happened. The bid must have been much higher. Uh, the bid of Bertelsmann must have been much higher uh, than uh, the, the ones from Vivendi, Hachette, and Harper and & Collins, so of course. Um, Viacom CBS slash Paramount Global went for that one, uh, but it didn't pass the test for the antitrust um, compliance. So PRH defense was focused on um, stating that the acquisition would provide a counterweight to Amazon's buying power, but the district of just the Department of Justice dismissed this argument, highlighting in its complaint that several PRH executives had made statements that the acquisition was consistent with a goal to be, a, and I quote here, an exceptional partner for Amazon. So U.S. District Court Judge Pan agreed with the DOJ on this one too. And uh, also when Simon & Schuster announced it was up for sale in March, 2020, its current CEO wrote to one of its best-selling offers, quote here, I'm pretty sure that the Department of Justice wouldn't allow PRH to buy us, but that's assuming we still have a Department of Justice. Well, it seems that Americans still do have a DOJ after all. So, 
what is my take on this? And what's my analysis on, uh, on this sort of more involved interventionism in mergers and acquisitions in, uh, in, in, in our era? Well, there's definitely more sustained inter inter interventionism in mergers and acquisition in the Biden era, which is consistent with the approach taken in the rest of the world. Uh, so indeed, President Joe Biden made, made competition a pillar of its economic policy, denouncing that what he calls the outside market power of an array of industries and stressing the importance of robust competition to the economy, workers, consumers, and small businesses. He has called on federal regulators, so not only the Department of Justice, the DOJ and the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, to give greater scrutiny to big business mer mergers and acquisitions. Well, they have indeed, they are indeed delivering. This is a continuation of the antitrust M&A enforcement policy applied by his predecessor, Donald Trump, which saw many big deals blocked, sued to block or threatened to block in a number of industry sectors, sometimes on antitrust grounds, other times on national security grounds. For example, in media, notable examples under Trump included the DOJ seeking to block the ATT, sorry, to block ATT from buying Time Warner, also Sinclair being blocked from buying Tribune Media, and also the major divestiture requirements on T-Mobile's deal for Sprint. In tech, um, Broadcom was blocked from buying Qualcomm. Canyon Bridge from buying Lattice Semiconductor and Drafts King from merging with FanDuel during the, um, of the Trump presidency. So these antitrust challenges have taken place against the backdrop of an increase in global NNA activity, which further accelerated uh, due to the repercussions of the economic crisis provoked by the management of the COVID-19 pandemic and also the stunting growth due to the Russian-Ukraine war. So subject to regu regulatory approval wars in the poor merger US for decades, an m and risk factor that merging companies disclosed as boilerplate. So basically they didn't really, you know, threat uh, that the uh, US uh, institutions would actually block the deal. For them, it was just, just like a given, but it, eventually it would go through, right? So subject to regulatory approval was just like a boilerplate, you know, yeah, yeah, we'll do it, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a given, we're going to get it. Well, today, however, it is rarely a foregone, a foregone uh, conclusion and post-announcement analysis is as much about if a deal will be allowed to close as it is about price, product, financing, layoffs, or strategic coherence. This is consistent with the rising power of various competition authorities around the world, and in particular in Europe. So just a few examples, but uh, the European Commission, which is the European Union body in charge of controlling mergers and acquisitions on antitrust grounds, has been particularly busy since 2020, 20, with 405 concentrations notified to it in 2021, representing not only a, a, an 11% increase compared to 2020, there was 361 concentrate no, uh, notifications, but also the second highest annual number of notifications since the introduction of the European merger control regime back in 1990. There's definitely an acceleration here of mergers and acquisitions in Europe, and in particular in the European Union. In 2021, the European Commission cleared 13, one free, 13% 13 more deals at phase one than in 2020, while opening seven phase two investigations, one less than in 2020. Additionally, as in 2020, there was no prohibition decision in 2021. The European Commission, however, blocked a deal in the shipbuilding industry in January 2022. Also in 2021, the European Commission cleared 11 transactions subject to remedies, so seven at phase one and four at phase two, compared to 16 in 2020. While 12 deals were withdrawn prior to a decision, nine at phase one and three at phase two. So what is this business about phase one and phase two? Well, what happens is that the, when there is a, a merger control and an application, a notification made to the European Commission, 
the um, European Commission starts phase one of the review of this uh, of this uh, application for a merger concentration, and then if there are some you know further doubts or or uh, basically needs further investigation, then the um, merger controls goes into phase two and um, when it's more complicated and it's more intense review etc cetera, etc cetera. and so um, these are the various steps uh, which are being uh, uh, you know uh, in, put in place in order to thoroughly double check each concentration which is notified in the European Union. Um, another example of uh, the rise of power of various competition authorities around the world is in Europe, the, sorry, is in the United Kingdom. Now that the United Kingdom has exited the European Union, the UK uh, competition and, um, and, of, um, and market authority, the CMA, competition and market authority, has definitely, you know, upped the ante in terms of reviewing and, and checking and sometimes even blocking concentrations. Um, in particular, its stance on the um, Activision Blizzard's acquisition uh, uh, by, by Microsoft, which is still under review, and the CMA, the UK CMA, is one of the competition authorities around the world, which was the first one to actually whis blow the whistle and say, whoa, we really do think this is, this is just generating too much uh, concentration in the... Um, in the gaming industry. So I refer you to my article on this subject on the um, 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 uh, potential acquisition of Activision Blizzard by, um, by Microsoft. So to conclude, while the blocking of the Penguin Random House acquisition of Simon & Schuster was based mainly on the negative effects such merger would have caused to offers as opposed to end consumers, i.e. the readers, it will be interesting to see whether the Federal Trade Commission also applies a similar rationale during its current probe of the priorly mentioned Microsoft acquisition of Activision Blizzard. Indeed, will the FTC check whether this acquisition of Activision Blizzard by Microsoft should be blocked because it would lower remunerations and advances levels? For game developers, these, these guys who are basically creating the content in the game industry, it's going to be interesting how the FTC um, tackles uh, and, and probes this, uh, this acquisition. Is it going to be uh, focused mainly on the negative effects uh, to the employees of Activision Blizzard or to the end consumers, like uh, the, 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 the gamers, or is it going to be focused on, um, on basically the content creators, the um, the um, uh, game developers like it was for the um, uh, PRH and Simon & Schuster acquisition. So let's watch the space and see what happens on this one. And uh, 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 Paramount Global, which still has its problem, which is that Simon & Schuster doesn't fit it into its, uh, into its business model and uh, portfolio of assets, now has to uh, find a new, uh, a new buyer. And um, and um, it, it is actually in a much better position because not only was it paid two hundred million dollars uh, of commission by PRH after the failed uh, uh, acquisition and the termination of the acquisition agreement, the purchase agreement, but also Simon and Schuster's accounts are uh, much in a much better position now than they were in 2020, um, just after the, um, I mean, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So apparently now it's even more of a, of a crown jewel in, uh, in the tiara of, uh, of, the, of, of uh, Paramount Global. So I think that there is a clear loser here, which is Penguin Random House and Bertelsmann, but I guess they can afford it because, hey, PRH is the first um, is the biggest book publishing house in the world. Um, and, and I'd say that, um, yeah, I think that um, Paramount Global and Simon and & Schuster managed to get out of a deal in a way which is good. And I'd say that the winner is the US government and um, the D Department of Justice. They really like, bam just um, you know, bam their fist and show that they have power and they can actually stop a deal. So the first question 
you know, that you and your company should ask yourself if you want to sell or if you want to buy a, a target is at the moment, you really need to reshuffle your priorities and ask yourself, okay, so do we actually have a good chance here to um, pass the regulatory checks? Are we not going to create a situation where there's um, less competition and too much concentration and other concentration because if the answers are no i mean are yeah um, are no and yes respectively then you just need to just you know kill the project or start you know to um back to to to, to uh, step number one and see how you can you can find a, a better solution because um yeah now the um us um institutions but also definitely the european institutions will enforce antitrust law um, uh, during these post-merger um, phases this is all from me for now um do not hesitate during the the stream to actually ask some questions next time if you have i think there is a way for you to ask some questions um in a sort of chat box so don't hesitate to do that in to do that in the future. For now, I bid you farewell and um, uh, see you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye bye.